Good morning. Yes, especially if you are worshiping with us for the first time. My name is Femi, and we are happy to have you here. Hope that the service has been a blessing uh, thus far, and we pray that it will continue to be a blessing. Amen. Um, yeah, I introduced myself by name, but uh, I should tell you a little bit about um, myself, particularly growing up. Um, there, there was a problem considering what, what was he going to do in life? Because I happen to have um, a, a set of talents like that most people didn't have. So apart from the, um, you know, all the ma mathematics, engineering, all of those things, I, I was a very good singer. <laughs> very, it's a very good singer. My parents were like, man, if we unleash this guy on the world, Michael who? You know? <laughs> Um, so, so like that, that like no, the, um, the world ain't ready for him. And then I was good at drawing, drawing. I was good at drawing, painting, everything. And, and I thought, you know, the world didn't appreciate Van Gogh when he was around. You know, so I decided, no, you know, um, I won't do that. One I really considered, though, was acting. Yeah, I was, you know, acting. I was really, really good at acting. But then, Nollywood at the time. <laughs> and even Nollywood now. Hollywood. You know, the Bible says, it says, it says, there were some people, the world was not worthy of them. <laughs> Hollywood wasn't worthy of me. <laughs> because I, I was thinking, where is the best place for me to express my talented acting gifts? If it's not Hollywood, it's not Hollywood, it's not Bollywood. So I decided I won't be an actor, I'll be a pastor. Because they said the best actors are the best pastors. Some people, you want to say amen to that now. Uh, welcome. Uh, but speaking about actors, I, but I decided I'll just study some of the ones that the world, um, the world say they are good actors. And one of my favorite actresses um, is a lady called Sally Field. Anybody know that name, Sally Field? Where are the Gen X's around here? Yeah, okay, yes, Chine, we see you, we see you. Ah, but, okay, you're not Gen X. Okay, you, you study history. Sally Field, great woman, great actress. See, so if you ever saw any of the popular films, still Magnolias, I know it's old, 1989. Okay, uh, Miss Delphire, that was more recent, 1993, you know, more recent. Uh, Forrest Gump, 1994, very, very recent. So, obviously, Sally Field, great woman. But those were more like the big uh, movies. Her, her legendary status was actually rooted in her two Oscar wins. She won two Oscars. Um, the first one was for a film called No Marie. That was done in 1979, but she won the Oscar in 1980. At this point, she's, she's, she's probably about 33. 33. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Ah, hold on, please. Thank you. <laughs> she's probably about 33 years old. And when she won the Oscar, you know what's funny? She hit the pinnacle of her career. And yet there was something missing. Something missing from her on that day and every single day, five years after, until she got her second Oscar win for Places, Places of the Heart. Or is it Places in the Heart? Places of the Heart in 1985. What was missing? What was missing? Well, don't let me tell you what was missing. Why don't we listen to Sally Field tell us what was missing in her now famous acceptance speech for her second Oscar in 1985? I owe a lot to my family for holding me together and loving me and having patience with this obsession of me. But I want to say thank you to you I haven't had an orthodox career, and I've wanted more than anything to have your respect. The first time I didn't feel it, but this time I feel it, and I can't deny the fact that you like me right now. You like me. Did you hear that? She wanted nothing more, nothing more than to gain their respect. And not just gaining that 
when she felt that she'd gained their respect, she felt that they liked her. They liked her. She wanted to be liked above everything by her peers. As wonderful, as successful, as elegant as she is and was, she showed that she was just like you and I. We struggle with this thing to be liked and there's nothing bad about it, but there's a way it's so deep that it becomes an idol. This idol to be approved of. For those who weren't here with us last week, maybe I can just break it down. One of the things we're saying is that if you want to live a life that pleases God, one of the things you want to do is to sin less. This thing we call sin, which is ultimately at its root, displeasing God. Yes, it means breaking the commandments that God has set forth, but it is ultimately he puts those commandments there for your good, but also to please him because he wants your good. But many times, even though we know what sin is, we still commit it. Why? Because there's something that is working in our hearts. We set up idols in our hearts. And we say these idols, these idols of the heart are like an iceberg. And when you think of an iceberg, we often see what is on top. But we said that it's not just what is on top. The iceberg is made of the surface iceberg and the deep iceberg that is beneath. And the deep one is usually bigger. And we said the idols of the heart work like that. The ones that we often see, the surface idols, are the idols of money, sex, power, ethnicity, reputation, you can call those out, but the thing that is empowering them at a deeper level are the ones that are unseen. Comfort, control, which we looked at last week. Acceptance, security, satisfaction. And of course, this one, which I think, I don't want to say is the most dangerous of them all, but I do want to say this. I think it is the one that has the most number of culprits. Approval. Approval. Here's what I want to tell you. If you don't deal with this idol, it will deal with you. But by God's grace, someone has walked in here and you will hear a liberating word that gets you free from this idol in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we pray that you would expose this idol and the way it works in our hearts. We've not come, oh God, here to be exposed We've come for you to expose the things that are working against us. We've not come here to be condemned, O oh Lord. We have come so that you will liberate us. Do a liberating work, Spirit of the living God, this morning. And free us, O oh God, from the things that hold us bound. And set us into the path of liberty that you set for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to look at this idol of approval under these three headings. The judgment we give, the judgment we need, and the judgment we receive. The judgment we give, the judgment we need, and the judgment we receive. So let's start with the first one, the judgment we give. Now if you look at verse 2, Paul is talking about something here. He says, now it's required that those who have been given a trust, and he's talking about ministers of the gospel, that they are given like a trust, a sacred trust. Now here is the trust. What is required of the character of the person that handles their trust? They must be faithful. They must be faithful. Now, we're not talking about who a true minister is or the characteristics of a minister. I just want to draw out something from that, which is this. If they must be faithful, there has to be a standard for which we judge faithfulness. You can't just say it abstractly and not know what it means. There has to be a standard. Now, here's the question that we get from the next verses that Paul is asking. Who is going to be the judge of that faithfulness? Who judges? The, what standard are we going to use to judge? Well, Paul tells us about two sources of that judge, of, uh, two kinds of judges that he doesn't care for. He says, for instance, I, I shouldn't be the judge. And he says, I actually care little what you think, your own judgment, whether it is you or any human court. Now, when you listen to that, all of a sudden you'll be like, Paul, you're saying, I don't need to be approved by any of you. I don't want to be approved by myself. Does Paul have a problem with approval? He shouldn't have a problem with approval because I don't have a problem with approval. You shouldn't have a problem with approval. We can't live life without approval. 
Just think about it. Uh, people that work uh, directly with me, when they want to go and leave, they put in an application. If they have to go on the application, you know what I must do? I approve it. Some of us, you put in an application to change your house, right? So that you can rent a new place. If the landlord does not approve and you move in, you're a fraud. We need approval. For those of you who have proposed to a lady to be your wife or maybe just to be your girlfriend, she said nothing and you are talking about your GF on IG. Stop it. You didn't get approval. Can't move forward without approval. What is approval in itself? Approval is essentially getting the affirmation for hitting the standard set for achieving certain things. Getting the affirmation for hitting the standard set for achieving certain things. That's what approval is. Said in that way, it is not just a good thing. It's a necessary thing. So, Mr. Paul, what problem do you have with approval? Let me tell you his problem. His problem is not with getting approval per se. His problem is with the craving, the craving, the craving for approval. Whenever we crave it as something that we need above any other thing, then approval has taken an idolatrous turn. And it does, it affects the way we live our lives. Should I tell you one way? It's really hidden in the first two commandments of, that God gave Moses for the children of Israel. The first commandment is this. I'm sure we all know the Ten Commandments. If I ask you now, you'll be able to say it off the bat, you know, right? Right? I didn't lie in the house. Yeah, okay. But the first commandment is essentially this. Don't have any gods apart from the true God. Don't have any gods apart from the true God. It's the foundational commandment. Breaking any of the nine other commandments means you break the first one. So let's talk about the second one because the second one is very closely connected to it. It is you will not have any image of this true God that you cannot have any other gods besides. Don't create an image. You can't create the image. All the other idols of the other nations were images of the gods that they had. He's saying, you can't create an image of me. Do you know why? This is why in Israel, when they had the Ark of the Covenant that's, that, that, that um, represented the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant has the image of the cherubims that are around his throne. They don't have an image of the God himself. He can't be seen. The reason why you can't create an image for God is because he's already created his image. And they're all around. She says, don't create. Whenever you try to create an image, it's always a problem. And here's the thing. Once this idol, this idol of approval drives us, we create something that a lot of people who are advertising experts or brand experts, they know. It's an image. You have an image instead of an identity. You have a persona instead of a person. What is an image? What's the difference between an image and an identity? An image is this fabricated, is a fabricated expression of myself, the fabricated expression of myself that I want you to see. Identity is who I truly am. So in order to gain approval, what we start doing is creating personas and images of ourselves. And God says, whenever you create images, it's always a bad thing. In fact, it leads to an idol. So Paul says... For those who crave, crave the image of approval, we can distinguish them into two kinds of idolaters. Two kinds. Remember the first one? He said, I don't care what you think about me. So there are people that care too much about what people think about them. We call them people pleasers, number one. Then he says, I don't really care about what I think about myself, so I don't judge myself. There are people that care too much about how they approve themselves. We call them self-pleasers. Do I have any people pleasers or self-pleasers in the house? Don't answer. We're going to find out. I'm going to give you five characteristics of, characteristics of each of them with sub-points to explain what I mean. So, symptoms of idolatrous people pleasers. Um, it says, one, you are obsessed with your physical appearance and your social, and or your social profile. Don't worry. The tables haven't started shaking. They will soon start shaking. So let's explain some of that. What does that mean? Um, 
You're a slave to dressing and enhanced appearances. I put enhanced appearances to make it, you know, sound a little bit more uh, posh. I'm talking about makeup uh, and some other things, right? You are a slave to that. And uh, let's put the second one. Let's put the second one because it's related. You take and post an incessant amount of pictures. Oh, now they are shaking. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not talking about dressing nice. Well, you look fly. I'm talking about the kind of dressing that when you dress, you are saying it so that they go know, they go know. Do you understand? So I got out today. You know, sometimes there's the difference between dressing nice and stepping out, dressed to kill. Some people talk about being slain in the spirit. Some people talk about being slain by my drip. But here it is. It's a big problem. I do think so because... When you are such a slave to dressing, you, you care so much about people thinking that you are this kind of person. And most likely you are not that kind of person. It's an image, not your identity. And we see that in the way we post pictures. and the way we, First of all, not the posting of pictures, taking the pictures. I am young enough to know when you had 36 uh, chances to take one picture with this film. Right? Why do you think that the memory size of phones keep increasing all the time? It's because of you. <laughs> because when you have to have one pose, just one pose, equals to 15 pictures. Ta, 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 ta. That's that pose. But then what betide you if you, what betide us if you travel? That day you are going to take 28 poses. 28 times 16. One day. So they are trying to make, ah, man, it's no longer, we're going to tear our bites very soon, so you know. It tells the phones. And you keep looking at all these images. But you see the irony of it? You keep taking, taking, taking for this image, and you can't look at all of them. You've taken 100 pictures in a day, just one day. But if you can't see it, people must see it. So first of all, you spend how much time trying to edit which one is the perfect post? Let me tell you, all of them, that, all, which one is perfect picture? All the pictures, they are of you, whether you are perfect or not. So we post it. And when we post it, the next one, after we post it, you compulsively and religiously monitor your likes, comments, and views on social media posts. I'm going to say something now about this picture taking. Please, I said in the first service, I want to say it again. Please, as I'm saying this thing, I am not talking to anybody in particular here. I'm saying it again. I am not talking to anybody in particular here. I'm commenting on something that you may have done, but that people do generally. Okay. I am not. We live in a time where at a wedding, the most important person at a wedding has been, has been the, the minister has been replaced by the photographer. I be at the lie. I will tell you why. Go and check. And I've spoken to my fellow ministers, and because that happened to me too. Services have started later than they, were, than they are meant to have started. You know why? Because the couple were still taking photographs. The photographer didn't come on time. And of course, we can't move on. The guests, ah, you all have to wait. Photographer, this thing. The person that is meant to bless your marriage, bless your marriage, bless your identity for the next couple of decades has been replaced by the one that can boost your image. After all, if it doesn't go on Bella Niger, what did we marry? <laughs> I'm talking about something really serious. People are more concerned about their videos. People are more concerned about their pictures than getting a blessing. Do you see that we have a problem? And this is why we're so hit by social media as well. This is why some people, the next one, are so moved by when people do not post. Do not, uh, their, their family and friends don't follow you, don't like your post. You follow the thing over and over. You say, ah, 14 likes? The last time I checked, and I checked about 20 seconds ago, it was 14 likes. May God help us. Second one, and we'll have to run through. Second one, um, you naturally exaggerate things to make yourself look good. Exaggerate. Embellish. Just lie. Sometimes we just manipulate those ways so that we can get compliments because we are compliment addicts. 
You know what I mean by trying to find your way. You know how you can, somebody didn't give you a compliment, but you, you, you know how to draw it. My next part. My wife and I would just be going, ah, man, ah, service was good today. I, I was telling her, you know, I was telling me about how service was good, though, that the sermon even blessed herself. Wow. I don't even know. Did you pick up anything? It did. <laughs> My wife would say, yeah, it was very long. I'm moving and I say, now what for you? You know when you fish for compliments, you just fish. It wasn't there, but you're just forcing people to say, to say, you're addicted to compliments. Third one, you're terrible at receiving feedback. You see, because an idol, as I said, it's an image, an idol fight back when you, it seems like you attack them. So you feed, critical feedback, keep going, critical feedback is taken personally. And so one critique among many praises, it deflates you. I know somebody who said, I wrote a book, put it on Amazon. He was getting five-star reviews all around. All five stars. He got 89 five-star reviews. He got one, one, one-star review. He couldn't sleep. He went and checked the profile of the person that gave the one-star review. He was trying to look for, is there a way I can mail him? Why? Why did you put one star? What? What did I do? It personal and because of that, when you have personal animus towards anyone who critiques you, even when you don't admit it, you know how no, angry, I'm not angry. Why? <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm not. If the man is dumb and he doesn't see it, why would I be angry? You know why you don't want to admit it? Because your image also has to show you as somebody that's got it together. So you're upset, but you don't you're upset that the person attacked your image, but you don't want to behave as though. Ah. I now believe I look desperate that uh, they didn't they didn't want me. They didn't ah no 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 no. But all the while it's there. Fourth one. You are unavoidably or uncontrollably defensive when confronted. All right, keep going. Let's keep going. The fourth one is this: you live with a great deal of anxiety at the possibility of upsetting people. You are you can't you. The thought of people being upset at you. It's a problem. So, you know what happens? You, it's essentially, you, you are someone that has no values. Next one, no values. You have no um, uh, principles. Maybe I can explain that as a flip-flopper. Let's say there are three of you. Person A, person B, and you're person C, right? And A and B, you're all friends. Three of you are friends. But A and B have a problem. So, you go and visit A, because you know there's a problem between them. And A starts telling you about B. She runs her mouth too much. Ah! She's always like this. And you're like, yeah, it's true. Oh, I remember that other time she did this, did this. And like, hey, that's what I'm talking about. So you're happy. A is happy. You're not going to B. B says that she loses her temper too much. She's like, yes, I remember that time she lost my temper. What do you stand for? You only stand for one thing. No principles, no values. You stand for the fact that you must be liked. So you flip-flop. Finally, last one. You lack... Sorry, yeah, you regularly make bad decisions because your judgment is clouded by the goal of pleasing others. So as a result of that, you make bad decisions with your money, you make bad decisions with your relationships, and you make bad decisions with the use of your time. Bad decisions with your money, spending, you know how they say, we spend money to buy things we don't, we spend, on, um, uh, the we, the, we spend the money we don't have to buy the things we don't need to please the people that we don't like. Because at least they can bow before the image we've created. In the same way as well, some of us enter into relationships that you know that you know that you know I should not be in this relationship with this person. But he likes me. Oh, she likes me. I can prove to you she likes me. I really took a flower. I removed all the rose petals. He likes me. She likes me not. She likes me. She likes me not. She likes me. He landed on she likes me. And yet there are many other signs that are there that this person is not good for you. But you're addicted to that liking. And the same thing for those of us who want to say, um, we don't live disciplined lives without time. We can't say no. We can't say no. And if you think I'm condemning you, I'm just speaking to myself. And so until you now become, because you have decided to see everybody, you have decided to say yes, until you now feel overwhelmed, you now become bitter, you now lash out. You know the ironic thing about this stuff is this. For people who are people pleasers, you are trying to please people by trying to help them. But you, uh, you can end up destroying or ruining their lives or doing something that hurts them. 
How many of us have ever heard of a person called Bernie Madoff? Anybody? Bernie Madoff? Uh, if you've not heard of him, you have to hear of him. He's a legend. Legend. Bernie Madoff perpetrated the biggest financial fraud ever known to man. Recorded that we know. The biggest Ponzi scheme ever. Bernie Madoff, as far as we know, cheated people of, wait for it, 64, not million, but billion dollars. At the current exchange rate, you know your calculator cannot even compute that amount. So what do you think? He was evil. I mean, to be that, he was greedy to be that, to take all that amount of money. He must have, he doesn't have a conscience because he ruined people's lives. True, but it was a bit more complicated than that. Here's what Fortune magazine wrote about Bernie Madoff in 2009. Right? It says, everyone seems to agree that Bernie Madoff was evil. Now, this is a secular magazine. And he was, but he was even in a strange way that doesn't fit any conventional conception of the term. His disorienting mixture of occasional concern for others and deeply ingrained line of legitimately earned respectability and the coldest hearted malevolence with destroyed lives helps explain how he perpetrated history's largest Ponzi scheme. Going on. He then says after... He doesn't appear to have wished his victims ill. He wasn't out to hurt them. Just the opposite. He described himself as a what? People pleaser. Well, there's no reason to believe anything made of says. Evidence supports that self-description. Ultimately, fear of man can lead to utter devastation. And some of us are saying, thank God, me, I'm not a people pleaser. Wait for your own. Because they're idolatrous self-pleasers as well. These are people that care so much about their own standards, their own self-approval. That's all that matters. It's also an image, you see, that you have created. The first one is an image that you create so that people can bow to you. The second one is an image you create so that you bow to it. So who are these kinds of people? Well, the first characteristic or symptom that they have is that they have a grim view of life. Because, they, you see, they have an insight into the world that all you popular people, all the, the masses can't see. I can see. So it's like, do you know where we are going? He has a grim view of life. It means that you're always predicting doom and gloom. No matter the positive indicators that point to the contrary. Or, for instance, when it comes to people, you're always suspicious of people even when there's no reasonable or discernible reason to suspect people. Or let me even put this one. This one illustrates it even better. The final one on that. Keep going. Thank you. You are very uncomfortable with being complimented because you always question the generous of the compliment. You are good looking. Really? Why? Why do you say so? What was standard of good looking? Do, 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 do you even know the philosophy of beauty? <laughs> just say, don't just say things just say things and so when you live with this kind of grim view of life what do you think eventually happens the second one you are unable to be happy around people and people cannot be happy around you you are a perennial killjoy give some of the characteristics you always see negative aspects of people's joy they are dancing in church dancing in church is this the way you should be dancing in church is this, is this a sobering way of looking at things we are in the whole day, we are in the presence of God. There's always one negative aspect. Next one. How about this? You, you love to point out people's mistakes, not to genuinely correct them, but to prove your brilliance. You are, I said you're a killjoy. And then this is the worst one about that. Is this that you have you have little to no close friends and you don't care. You don't care. Third one about them. This is connected. This not caring is connected to an unwarranted level of self-confidence. You, you, you believe so much up in I don't, I don't know where you got it from. Just one day you just woke up and said I know more than everybody. I just know. You've not gone to school for it. Okay, you went to one school. You went to MIT. Alright, so? You went to Cambridge. Okay, so? And so this leads to you not being able to receive any kind of criticism. You dismiss I had dismissed critique from others because you believe you're above most people. Or maybe the next one, next one, um, you believe most people can't understand you because, oh, I'm very unique. <laughs> very unique. Because at the end of the day, it's only your standard that ultimately matters. Keep going. 
Convenient, you value convenience above helping others. You see, your the, the helping others has to be tied to your, inf your inflexibility of time. I'm a planner. And I need to be disciplined so that, you know, I don't want to make the mistake of people pleasers who always say yes. Me, I always say no. So you can't be flexible at all with your time. Your default answer to any request of help is no. And finally, the last one is this. You lack basic empathy. People are just obstacles to overcome or tools to be used. You objectify people. and You, person, you objectify persons and you personify objects. People are just mere statistics. They are numbers. So when you want to fire, when you want to let go of some people, you say something like this. Oh, oh, uh, we had efficiency savings. Efficiency savings. We reduced the cost of our overhead by 25%. Now, I'm not saying that you don't have to take some very tough decisions when you're in places of leadership. I'm saying when did people start, people's lives, people's dreams start being referred to as efficiency savings? So ultimately, uh, this kind of pride, Proverbs 29 verse 23 says, that pride eventually leads to humiliation. But here's the other part I want you to hear. Humility, on the other hand, leads to honor. What's the basic prerequisite of humility? It is self-awareness. So I want to ask you, are you self-aware at this point? Are you actually saying, I see myself here. Even if it doesn't wholly describe me, and these things I've listed are not exhaustive. But do you see yourself here? Because the first step towards being, towards being delivered of anything is acknowledging that I have a problem. And I pray that God will make us humble in this place in the name of Jesus. I pray that as you are submitting to it and saying, I am this person, that you're also asking the Lord who is able to deliver you to say, God, I am this person, deliver me and he will deliver you today. So that takes me to the second point. If that is the judgment that we give, what is the judgment we need? Because there has to be another way. There has to be another way. Whether it is us judging ourselves, it doesn't work. Whether it's people judging us, it doesn't work. If you take, for instance, why is it that people judging us doesn't work? When you create people's approval, you know at the end of the day, most people's approval or their standards are not the same. So you're trying to please this person, but this person's standard is contradicted to the other person. I mean, you will eventually lose your mind. But some of us think of an ideal situation. The ideal situation of everybody approving us. Jesus has word for you in Luke 6 verse 26. He says, woe to you when people speak well. Everyone speaks well of you. For that is how they treated their ancestors, the prophets, the false prophets. I told somebody recently, the person is reasonably famous. I told the person, I said, I don't want to be famous like you people. You know why? Because what do we do with famous people? The moment we celebrate, they were celebrating, they were celebrating, they, ah, Hilda Bassi, look at her representing us. Just wait after she hit the record. Four days later, somebody said, this is the Abbasi. Is it the one that posted this picture? You Christians are all coming around her. We carry people up just to take them down. So, if you are looking for people's approval as the way, believe me, it doesn't work. But if you are looking for your own approval with all your biases and imperfections, can you truly trust it? Paul says this. Paul says, my conscience is clear. But that doesn't make me innocent. My conscience is good. But that doesn't mean I'm right. So if I cannot trust the judgment of people and I can't trust the judgment of myself, I need another judge. I need another way. Paul says, I have good news for you. I can give you another judge. He says, let the Lord be your judge. That good news. Because he says it very confidently. Isn't that good news? Turn to your neighbor and say, we have a problem. We, we, have, we have a problem. The Lord, your judge. <laughs> I don't think I heard that because I, I don't know some of you who are married or some of you who are dating. I don't know what stage you are, you are in dating. But do you remember how this person that you've met that is the, 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 the one that you knew that when God was creating her, God was creating you at the same time. Forget that, you know, he sent you guys differently. That's why you're different ages. But, but, but it's the bone of your bone. 
How did you know she was the bone of your bone and he was the, the flesh of your flesh? How did you know? Because the first time you met, fortuitously, you guys had never met before. And you just started thinking, you too? You too? You're like, oh, you two, you like them, you like them. Oh, you two. And you started completing each other's sentences. You spent that night, you just spent hours chatting. The next day, you spent four hours just chatting because she completes you, she completes you. And he completes me. He just knows exactly what I feel. He knows me. <laughs> Such a good feeling. Three weeks after, he's a bastard. <laughs> Always criticizing me. Who is he? Who does he even say, what, what, what? You know what's happening? You know what's happening? Two days was enough that was needed to see the image that you had projected. But by the time you had gone three, four weeks, the person had gotten even closer to you, they had seen your identity. We love when people get close to us. Close to us enough for when it's comfortable, when they see the things that are good. But there's a point where we, they start getting too close to us. They start knowing us for who we are. This is why they say, don't get too close to your heroes. You may eventually get disappointed. They have feet of clay. And so, Paul, I don't understand. The Lord be my judge. You just said also that the Lord is going to expose the hidden things. And God is going to expose the motives. The motives. He sees my heart. I know a bit about my heart. If the Lord is my judge, man, then I'm condemned. Why would I want the Lord to be my judge? And Paul, excuse me. I don't think you two are perfect. How can you be this confident? Why are you recommending this as good news? Because it is good news. Let the Lord be your judge. Turn to your neighbor and say, let the Lord be your judge. Let me explain why. The reason is this, or let me illustrate. Let's talk about the guy in the Bible called David. David, the second king of Israel, after Saul. At some point, God had promised David he would be the king of Israel, but it took him decades before he became the king of Israel. Then eventually he was the king of his own tribe, Judah, and then there was a point where he consolidated the ten tribes, all the other tribes that were rebelling against him, they now came. So David is at a point where he has consolidated his rule over all of Israel. He's fine in Jerusalem. But David knows, I still need to tidy up on some things. There's something I haven't done. So he sends for a guy called Mephibosheth. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 6 to 8. And Mephibosheth comes. And let me tell you something about Mephibosheth when he comes. When you, if you are in the king's court, Mephibosheth is exactly the kind of person that should not appear before the king. Because in all the standards of appearing before the king, he is disapproved of. He is tattered. He is haggard. Because he has not been cared for, he has been rejected. Smelling and everything that you can think of. And what's worse, Mephibosheth is lame in his feet. And so as he comes before David, walking on his feet, Mephibosheth, knowing all that has happened to him in his life, he talks to David and he says, what do you want from a dead dog like me? The point in your life where you are so disapproved of by everyone that you stop thinking you are human. You can call yourself a dog. But it's not, it doesn't end there. There's more and more rejection, more and more failing of standards, more and more failing of standards of a job, more and more failing of standards in relationships, more and more failing of standards everywhere you can think of so that you are not just a dog, you're a dead dog. What do you want from someone like me? Why would you even want to talk to me? And David says, I've got news for you. I can see exactly who you are, but yet I'm going to lavish kindness on you. What? Isn't the king of Israel meant to be a good judge? Is he not meant to judge according to the law rightly? And David is saying, yes, I am judging according to the law very, very rightly. Because the basis upon which I am lavishing kindness on you has nothing to do with you, Mephibosheth. He says, I will, re I will, I will show you kindness for what? The sake of your father, Jonathan. Can I quickly break that down to you? Because David and Jonathan were the best of friends. Some would have said that Jonathan was meant to take the throne, but he saw that David was the one God had chosen. And because of this, he eventually lost his life. 
So when David thinks about Jonathan, he thinks about his beloved friend. So all of a sudden, David looks at Mephibosheth, who is connected biologically to Jonathan, he's his son. And when he sees Mephibosheth, do you know what he sees? He doesn't see Mephibosheth. He sees Jonathan. And so David reacts to Mephibosheth as though he is reacting to Jonathan. Listen to me. It is the same thing when the Lord becomes your judge. The Lord sees you, but he doesn't know you after the flesh. The Lord looks at you and he sees somebody else. His name is Jesus. And what do you think the Lord thinks about Jesus? Oh, in Matthew 3, verse 17, the Spirit came down on him and a voice of heaven came down and said, this is my beloved son, whom I approve. And if God approves of Jesus, when he judges you, he sees Jesus, not you. And so he approves of you. So he's saying, really? And this is not just, you know, there are some people in your life, you approve of them, only just. That is, you approve, ah, come and say, ah, no, we, we'll meet outside. You manage some friendships, isn't it? There are some people that can come to your house, but not your room. The people that can come to your room are the people that you greatly delight in. Can I tell somebody here today, as long as you are connected to Jesus, God doesn't just approve of you. He's not just managing you. He's not just maintaining some kind of relationship with you. Give me Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17. This is what God thinks about you. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you in singing. Do you hear what I am saying? That when God sees you, he's rejoicing over you in singing. Singing. That is the approval you need. But let me explain this thing one more step because somebody is saying this is some kind of spiritual, judicial abracadabra. How do you just exchange Jesus for me? On what basis? What about all the ways I've broken God's commandment that would make me unapproved before God? Just throw it away like that? No. And this is what you have to understand at the heart of the Christian message is this. Jesus came, but Jesus didn't just come. The same Jesus that God was saying, I approve of, not long after he was on a cross, where was the approval of God? My God, my God, Jesus said, why have you disapproved of me? Why have you forsaken me? But do you know what was happening there? Jesus had borne the guilt and the sin that we all commit because of the idol of approval and many other idols. So that when God was seeing Jesus on the cross, he really was seeing you. And so the seeming disapproval of Jesus on the cross was God judging Jesus rightly as though he was judging you. So that when God sees you, he can judge you as though he's judging Jesus. Do we, do we understand what I'm saying? So let the Lord be your judge, not on your own merit, not on things that you have done, but because of what Jesus has done. Now, how do we apply this? This is absolute good news. Because when, if you are addicted to compliments and you detest criticism, you can now deal with them. Compliments all of a sudden now just become affirmation. Not affirmation of your identity, affirmation of the things that you do. So the compliments do not swell your head. Criticisms also become criticisms of something you have done, not of you as a person. So all of a sudden, the criticism does not crush your heart. Maybe I'll explain this way. Take, for instance, people pleasers and compliments and criticism. Imagine you are a budding footballer. And your parents are a little bit modern, so they are saying, okay, uh, you can go to school, but we don't mind. We'll support this football dream of yours. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, maybe who knows, one day your two-week salary is all I need in my life. Um, so you play football, play football, your parents are always cheering for you, cheering for you. So you decide to invite more, some of your family members, and they're cheering for you, cheering for you. But you're not too satisfied with what some of them are saying. Because of, especially Antinike. Antinike can say, oh, my boy, you did so well. I'm so proud of you. That goal you scored, it was a fantastic goal. Antinike, it was an own goal. <laughs> it's, it's an own goal. That's, that's not how it works. So 
on the one hand, your family is approving of you, but you are not quite sure about their standards. You don't really understand. But on the other hand, you have some friends who, because you really do believe you are good, but some friends who are beefing you and they've seen you and say, eh, you are okay, but you are not that great. And so you have the criticisms here, you have the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 appro uh, the approval here, the, the compliments here. But you are not satisfied. You're wondering, am I really that good? Am I really that good? Because now, the affirmation of your family is somewhat getting to your head, but now you have the rejection of the people here and you're wondering, how do I deal with this? Because this one is paining me as well. Then one day, fortuitously, as you are playing, somebody who knew somebody that knew somebody knew someone called Lionel Mercy. And Messi happened to come and watch you play. He watched you play for 30 minutes. And by the time you guys finish playing, Messi comes to you. You know, his English is not very good and you don't speak any kind of Spanish. So Messi has only two words for you. Messi comes to you and he says, Agbabola. <laughs> and at that point, if Messi says they are an Agbabola, what does that mean for all the compliments anybody will tell you? At those points, they are compliments, but they don't really move you because it's not at the core of your identity. How about those that reject you and say that you can't play football? You say, my friend, shut up because mercy has said I'm an Agbabola. Can I tell you this? When God looks at you in Jesus Christ, you are always an Agbabola in approval. Not because of what you have done, but because of what Jesus has done. So now when criticism comes, criticism can just be a tool for your correction. It will never crush your heart. When Compliments come, it will not swell your head because you have received the approval of the one who alone matters. That's why the gospel is so important for approval. It takes us through all the difficult areas in our lives. It stops us from creating images. Listen, we are always creating bad images. God wants to work on our identity. And in Christ Jesus, he gives us a new identity. And guess what he says? Because he is the only one who is good at creating an image. He says, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Don't create any image. Allow God to create the image of God. He has already done that in Jesus Christ. And he's giving you an identity that now fits like that of Jesus Christ. And he's working in your life to be able to become more like him. His approval is all that we need. And if you believe and trust in him, you will get that stable identity that takes you through life's criticisms and life's compliments without bowing to the idol of approval. But I should say one more thing. Because all I've just said now may be fine and good, but it may still be a bit abstract in that you may live here and something happens tomorrow at work and you forget everything I said. This is why whenever we're ill, doctors may give us the right diagnosis, but you see, when they've given us the right diagnosis and every single thing and the right treatment, they've solved our problem, but we must still go back home and take our medicine over and over and over again. And that leads me to my third point. How do we get this so that it can become more part of us, more and more part of us? The judgment now that we receive. You see, the judgment we need is the judgment we must receive in our hearts. Do you remember Sally Field? What did Sally Field say? She said the first time, the first coming of the Oscar, I knew something, I didn't feel it. It took the second coming of the Oscar to make her feel it in very much in a similar way. The first coming of God in Christ was sufficient and objectively proved our salvation. But God says, no, to, for you to see that, yes, on the one hand, Christ's cross demonstrates the love of God objectively. But that which is objective, I need you to also feel in your heart. God came again. It wasn't now with the Son, but with the Holy Spirit. He says, the love of God is demonstrated in the cross of Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in will not perish, but have eternal life. But in Romans 5 verse 5, he says that the love of God, that same love of Christ, has now been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the Son of God, had the Spirit descend on him and he said, this is my Son 
whom I'm well pleased. In the same way, that same spirit comes into our heart, Romans 8 verse 16, and the spirit testifies with our own spirit that we are the children of God. What am I saying? We need the Holy Spirit's dosage of, I was going to say dosage of drugs. Um, you know what I mean? We need the continual renewal of the Holy Spirit to hear the approval, the approving word of God in our lives. But then, that still sounds a bit abstract. How do I keep being, receiving this renewing power of the Holy Spirit? For those of us who shop, um, you know it's a funny thing how uh, before you used to send people to go and shop for you. But um, as the Naira was going like this and dollar, all of a sudden, ah, we started going to market again. It's like, ah, market, no, nobody dies by going to market. <laughs> You know, the frustrating thing sometimes about doing grocery shopping, at least I remember growing up, is that you can go to, you have to go to different markets for different things. You know, if you go to okay, I mean, that's where you buy all the, your provisions, your conflicts, your milk, your, all of those things. But if you want to buy your meat, you have to go to another market. And then if you want to buy maybe fresh vegetables, you go to another market. So Saturday, my mom will carry, will go all, will go out everywhere. Mommy, yeah. Uh, right, so... We go to different markets. I just hated going to all these different places. And that's why God allows some people to invent something. How about if we could put all the markets in the right place? And we'll create a market. We'll create a super market where we can get everything that we need. Do you know that there is a supermarket of the Holy Spirit activity? A one-stop shop to get the feeling of the Spirit, but then all the works of the Spirit that enable you to feel the approval of God. Give me 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16. It says this, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16. It says, do you not know that you yourselves, and the you there is plural, you yourselves are God's temple. Now in 1 Corinthians 6, it talks about you personally. But now it's not talking about you personally. It is talking about you corporately. You are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst. If you ask me, how can I keep being filled with the spirit? It means really, get plugged, get, become a member, get committed to the church, to a church. Not the church, so I'm in this place and I'm in that place next week and I'm in that place. No, get committed to a church because it is in the church that you get the feeling and the, of the spirit. You know, there's a part in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 to 20. Can we read that? Ephesians 5, 18. It tells us, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. This is a continuous filling. It, it means that we always have to be filled with the Spirit. But notice, you cannot be filled with the Spirit in your house, in your room. Because notice what it says, speaking to one another with psalms. It didn't say speaking to yourself in psalms. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, meaning music matters. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. So that which is done corporately eventually ministers to you individually. Verse 20, it then says, always giving thanks to the Father, uh, God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be in church. That's where you get the help of God to keep receiving the approval of God in Christ Jesus. It is here that you receive, if I can give you four things, you receive the preaching and the teaching of God's word that tells you about your identity and comes against your image over and over and over again. Some of the things I'm telling you, by the time you get to Thursday, you've forgotten, so you have to come back and get a new dose on Sunday or go to your affinity group or go for your gospel community. That's what happened. You are constantly being filled. But somebody will say, hey, but I can get down a podcast. Let me tell you what a podcast cannot give you. The second thing, which is receiving the community that you need. Sometimes we need the approval of God by somebody coming to show us that approval. On my wife's birthday, somebody was giving a testimony about her and said, she wouldn't have known this, but one day the person came and said, I had a terrible week. I was feeling despondent. I was just feeling bad and awful. And as I came through here, you were sitting down at the back and there was a way you just smiled at me just smiled at me and it was as though I got an assurance that God is with me. Can you explain that? No, we can't explain it. It's just at that point, the approval of God that she needed was coming through the smile of one of God's precious people. You can't get that on a podcast. 
And for some of us, we need to not just receive that approval of Christ. Because in the church, you are not approved by your status. Many of us come from different walks of life. We, we have different ethnicities. All of those things. The thing that binds us all together is that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no greater title you can receive in the world than brother, sister. Once you come through that door, you MD, CEO, it stays outside. Um, um, uh, uh, governor, it stays outside. Senator, it stays outside. General manager, it stays outside. You come in here and we give you, you express a better identity. Brother, and sister in Christ. And you receive the community that upholds that. But the third thing is this. It is here that music, we sing together. Now I know some of us think that we are great singers, great, as great as I am, when you sing in the toilet and all of those things. I'm sure, you know, every time we sing in the toilet, we, sleep, we are singing like Nathaniel Bassi. In fact, even better than him. Right? But singing alone has its own experience, but there's a different one where you are, we are all singing together to the Lord. He says, when you sing together, then all of a sudden you are making melody in your own heart. And there's a way music, I don't know about you, there's a way music just ministers, ministers. You know, part of the problem with rejection, somebody sang a song, he said, it's so good loving somebody, and somebody loves you back. But they have to put it to a song. And the same way that God is singing over us, we too can sing back to God. And somehow the falsehoods of you don't matter, you don't, you, you don't matter or you are all that matters. All of a sudden, when people are singing to the Lord, all of a sudden, remember, he's the one that matters. And his approval is all that matters. This is how we receive the help of God. And I'll close with this one. I'm sure you pray at home. I thank God for that. But the difference and the way the Spirit fills you, when you pray at home, and when you are prayed for, when you, are pr when you pray along with people, there is just a different way the Spirit ministers to you. He moves from one person to the other, inspires you to want to pray, but also it just ministers the right thing to you, and sometimes it does something supernatural. Last week, um, there was someone in church who, for, for a number of months now, So I've been a bit close to. And so the person has been sharing with me about some of the struggles that she's had uh, with my wife and I. And one particular thing that she's mentioned is something that she knows God wants her to do, but she's scared. It's a noble thing. She started in a way, but she didn't put the full energy behind it. And so she's been dealing, dallying about it because of fear of different things, how it will be perceived and all of that. And so she's been struggling. So I've been encouraging her and all of those things. But something happened last week. And again, this is the kind of thing that can only happen in church. You know, we asked for people to come out to be prayed for. And when she came out to be prayed for, there's someone in this church, I don't know how many of you know who um, uh, um, Cole Larry is, but let me just say, people see, people prophesy. This man is a prophet. I know. This man, this man, they see, you know. All I tell myself, I say, that guy, they see. Because he'll be seeing things of personal things I know with people. He's never met them, and he'll be seeing, I'll be like, ah. Why am I in call? He sees things. So towards the end, uh, towards the end of the day, we were at an affinity group. He came to meet me. He said, I just wanted to share something with you. He said, whilst we were praying, there was a lady that came forward. I can't quite remember I don't know her name or what have you, but he now described who she was sitting with. So I, I said, I know who the person was. I described. They said, yes, that's the person. He said, he saw her, that she just came, all of a sudden he was praying. He just opened his eyes and he saw a vision. And in that vision, he saw her in a place and she was doing certain things. I don't want to say it because I don't want to give away the person. But she was doing certain things. Now, those things she was doing was an exact representation of the thing that she has been struggling with that God had been telling her to do. I told him, I said, if I tell her about this thing, now if she was here hearing it, she would start crying. To God that made me, we got home, called my wife and I, we called her, told her the thing, she started crying. Do you know why she was crying? It's not just because she gets a confirmation from God that this is what he's doing. It's because she now knows that God sees her and that despite her, her hesitancy, despite her trading God for fear, that God still approves of her. 
you can only get the help of the Spirit in a certain way, the way you need, in the approving way. The, to get the approval of God, you can only do that in church. So I want to ask you, I want to beg you, if you've not joined, and I mean committed to a healthy church, do so today. And if you are looking for one, can I recommend this church? We're not perfect, but here's what I can tell you. The Spirit of God is here. And if He is here, you will hear the approving word of Christ. He is here to help us. So let's rise to our feet because we're going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to pray. We're going to ask for the help of God. Because I do know that obviously there are some of us here who have seen ourselves as people pleasers. But it's a struggle. And you need the touching work of God. Maybe people to pray for you. Can I ask for some of the prayer band people to come? Can I ask for any of the leaders or pastors to come as well? They're going to lay hands on you. So maybe you are struggling with people pleasing. Or maybe you are struggling with self-pleasing. Maybe not the thing that, was, that, that you are struggling with was not on that list. But you, that list revealed enough to say, I am struggling with this. Your heart is hard and it's cold and dry. But God said, I will pour water on the thirsty ground. I'm going to ask you to take a bold leap of faith because you don't know what God can do at this moment. Come forward. We want to pray for you. Come forward. We want to pray for you. The Lord is our helper. The Holy Spirit is called our helper. Come forward. We want to pray for you. That you receive a fresh touch of the Spirit. You receive the help of the Spirit. Come forward. They want to pray for you. Oh, oh, oh. Start praying as somebody that's receiving the help of the Lord. Place this idol before him. He is the idol smasher. We don't play or fiddle with idols. We smash them. But the spirit of the Lord is here to fill somebody. And we can see the end to our idol. Whoa. Whoa. Lord God, we call for your presence. Holy Spirit, we ask that you shepherd the minds of your people. For all those who have stepped out of God in faith, knowing that they need of you. when the spirit comes is this. Jesus said, I have come, but another one must come. For if I do not come, the spirit, the spirit, the helper cannot come. And they were wondering, but how will we see you again? He says, oh now, when the spirit comes, he will say the things about me. He will testify about me. And so as the spirit comes now, you are hearing, you are hearing the voice of the shepherd. He says, my people know my voice and they hear. You are seeing that he's more precious than gold. You are seeing he's more precious than that person's approval. You are seeing that that rejection matters nothing because you are accepted. The Spirit is here. He's speaking to your heart. The Spirit is here. He's lifting your heart. He's showing you the beauty of the exalted one. And he said, I'm going to lavish on you. I'm going to lavish on you. Not because of what you've done, but because the Father is pleased in Jesus. And because of that, I will give you a new heart. Ezekiel 36 says, I will pour clean water on you and I will free you from all your idols. And he said, I will put a new spirit in you. I will give you a new heart and that it becomes because of that, you will now be able to keep my laws. Lord, we pray for the help of your people. We pray, Lord, as they are asking, as they are asking, oh Lord, hear their cries. As they are asking, see their desperation. They are not asking for money. They are not asking for riches. They are asking for greater riches that they may see themselves in the identity that you have given them. 
Lord, but because you are a helper, you will help them. You will help them. I, 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 For some of us, it is the disapproval that we got even from our own parents. You did everything. Maybe you are the second child. Maybe you are the third child. You did everything to try to prove that you are worthy. Maybe even now you are slaving your way. Just trying to show them that you are the child that they never thought you would become. And so you are spending on them. And yet they don't show you that love. For some of us, maybe that you recently have been jilted. Maybe you are not married at this point and you think people don't approve of you. I stand upon the word of the Lord. That even if all men may reject you, it only matters that the one who is on the throne above stands before you. For if God is for us, then who can be against us? In the name of Jesus, I pray that nothing shall define you again except the cross of Christ. Paul says that now, because of that cross, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Only the voice of Christ shall speak for you. Only the identity of Christ shall speak for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the deep work that you are doing. Thank you, Lord, because all these disappointments or all these compliments that bring an inflated ego, they are coming to an end now. Thank you, Lord, that your people are no longer bowing to images they've created or presenting images that they have created. No. We thank you because there is an image that is greater than all images. For Christ is the express image of the living God. And they are now being conformed to his image. I declare over you that it is that image that will speak for you. I declare over you that as you leave this place, as you go into the week, that you will go as a confident child of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For you have set the captives free. And whosoever the Son has set free, hallelujah, is free indeed. Go in this wise. The Lord bless you.